You are listening to the SDSU Football Podcast, presented by the East Village Times with your hosts, Andre Hagverdian and Paul Garrison. Welcome back, everybody, to the SDSU Football Podcast. I'm your host, Andre Hagverdian, joined, as always, by Paul Garrison. We've been gone for about four weeks, so... Uh, no way. Is, that, is this episode one? Please. And it's not, no, I think this is 65. 65, 65. So you don't start over. No. Yeah, that was, okay, okay, okay. okay. And, and, uh, and, and, it, and it hasn't been an eventful month at all. No, no, not at all. I, I went to Europe at, on the, in the perfect time, a lot. Oh, oh man. I, I, um, I don't know if you're ever going to forgive yourself, man. I know. I, I've been telling people that I was probably the first person in history to be on a cruise ship. Traveling through the Mediterranean Sea to Italy and Spain and France, and would rather be in Houston, Texas. <laughs> that, was, that was to be the first time in history that, that somebody could say that. But I, I, I felt it. I, I uh, you know, tried to keep up with it as much as I could. You know, going yeah. out the head and with games in the middle of the night. And uh, thankfully, I had people like you and and. Other, you know, people on Twitter and and Facebook and social media who were there, who were sharing pictures and videos and stories. So, like, part of me felt like I was there. Yeah, I absolutely. Feel the atmosphere, even though I was, you know, nine hours somewhere else. But it was a pretty incredible run. It was, and and you know, I think you were there in more than just spirit because. You know, we had two media members, two writers, I should say. We had, and Don was there as as a photographer. We had two um, writers there, uh, me and Austin. But they gave us three seats, so I think yeah. they were planning on you being there, bro. I think I think everybody was just like, you know, Andre is going to be showing up. You know, kind of like has one moment in time and just take his seat. You know, with the gathered media. So I thought that was pretty funny, and and yeah, it was an experience, man. It it was something else. I mean, just the court in and of itself w- was just yeah. something else to to see that inside of a football stadium and you know the first game against FAU uh there was a lot of empty seats the championship game not so much and to to play in front of you know all those people man was was just different it was just so different to have it be so spaced out but um you know Aztec Nation showed up i think it was e- they were easily the, the the biggest group and contingent of fans there i mean that shot that lamont butler hit i mean that's that's unbelievable man it was it was incredible trying not i mean it just it was a stunning moment you know for a game to be so much in fau's favor the entire game and then for san diego state to just kind of you know rip their hearts out at the very very end it was poetic and it was great and it it was you know it's one of those i think things that you're everybody who was there or who was watching on tv is going to remember what they were doing you know when lamont butler hit that shot or on their phone in their room on a cruise ship (laughs) at 2 30 in the morning yeah yeah see i mean you know makes it special for everybody in, in in different ways in different ways you know, there's a lot of talk about it being kind of a springboard for San Diego State basketball about how, you know, they fell one one game short, but they're going to be back and they're going to win it next time. And it's, you know, I, I think nothing in life is ever guaranteed and certainly nothing in sports is ever ever guaranteed. You know, you never know when you're going to make that run. Like they, they were tied with Charleston with two minutes left in the first round. Right. A couple of shots go a different way and they lose in the first round again. The same team, the same players. So you just never know. It's, there's a reason why it's called March Madness. Right. That's and so right. When you're making that run, you want to do as whatever you can to ma- actually win it because you may not get back there. And obviously they did. They fell one game short. And it's just we'll we'll see. You know, you know, they've already gotten uh, a good transfer from, from USC. We'll see who, what other guys they get. I think it'll help them nationally with recruiting, but you know, it doesn't guarantee they're going to be back in the national championship game. 
I could see San Diego State having a better team or two in the next three to five years than they had this year and not getting this far. It's just that's just kind of how it goes, right? In a in a single elimination tournament. So that's why who as you said, we'll cherish this moment and the moments you had, whether you're in Houston, whether you're at Viejas watching a watch party, whether you're wherever. Uh, because you don't know. I mean, this is the first time they made it to a Final Four in how many years? You know, hopefully it won't take that long, that many years for them to get back. But as I said, nothing's guaranteed, and you just never know what's going to happen. So, what, which is why it's it's good to have, cherish and have those memories for this run because you just don't know. I agree with you, and I, I think that you know, in that vein, whether it was after the game at the celebration that was kind of the question that i was trying to ask coach dutcher repeatedly was was was, what's your reflection what's your reflection he's like i'm working man i I, my reflection will happen in a few weeks you know i'll be able to to really see what that's like and um it was amazing how quickly you know these elite competitors can just like go from okay now that was great now we're not satisfied we got to keep going and move on to the next thing um, but we don't have to do that, you know, as as people who cover the team. And and so I think everything that you said is is spot on. And and I also think that to add to what you're saying, it, there is a ton of flux around college sports right now. And anybody who feels like they know what is going to happen is either really smart or just wrong. <laughs> And, yeah. you know, some, somebody's going to be right because, but there's a million predictions and like 999,000 will be wrong. And and so there's just so many different variables and factors that are going on. I mean, you talk about the next three to five years in the next three to five years, San Diego state's going to be playing in a different conference and whether, whether that conference, the makeup of that conference is, you know, the, the PAC 12 as it's currently as it currently sits or it's the pac 12 that got raided and they kept the name, but they just brought in the best mountain West schools and other schools that they could do. Right. Um, so they're going to be playing in a, in a, in some sort of different conference affiliation in the next three to five years, most likely um, NIL is not going to be new. I mean, every single time we have a conversation with anybody around NIL all they can talk about is, oh, they just made this rule change and this means this. Um, and we're talking about, you know, the second transfer window and, you know, things like that. Uh, there's a lawsuit that's pending around the University of Miami, which is kind of the 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 first NIL group to just like leap out there and say, you know, I'm a multimillionaire. I'm a billionaire. I'm going to just pay these guys and, and and call it a collective. But we all know what's going on. It's pay to play and da, da, da. Well, the NCAA in suing them, and I believe it actually centers around uh, women's basketball at Miami, you know, it's going to have the opportunity to to lay out how exactly how they're working, how much of the interactions are between the university and the collective and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And so, like, if if that ruling happens in a way that prohibits these big donors from doing that or somehow put some uh kind of puts a little bit of it back into the bottle like it's it's a different it's a different way of going about it and and so i just think that there's there's so much unknown around san diego state basketball that it's really difficult to make a prediction of what it will be but no matter what that future is there's always going to be this run to the final four. No, no coach can ever come back and recruit against San Diego state and say, ah, it's not possible. You know, it can't happen because they did it and they got to the national championship game. And so no matter what those pieces are there, uh, no, you know, I loved all of the, the times when Steve Fisher over the years would say, you know, I want you to sit back and dream. Well, you don't have to dream. Like it was a reality. They were there. They saw it that's always going to be with this group and is going to be part of the ingredients that, that continue to make the program. But um, it is uncertain times. And, you know, unless there's another global pandemic, which I never thought the first one would get here, you know, they're not going to be able to ever have as old of a team 
as they had. Yeah. I mean, there's just so much that you could that you could talk about and you could go into it. But it was it was a great thing for the city, a great thing for the for the community, and 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 you know what they're trying to build with with the momentum surrounding San Diego State sports um, going forward. At least in the college basketball sense, like NIL, look at this year's Final Four. You have Miami that's potentially paying guys 800K, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. San Diego State's paying guys 24K. They both got to the Final Four. So right. both avenues seem to work, right? I don't know how UConn's NIL. It's pretty good. It's pretty good? Okay, yeah. And Florida Atlantic, you know, they're they're probably not. They're, they might be more closer to the San Diego State range than than Miami yeah. and UConn. But what's interesting is like right now you're looking at football and basketball in the midst of like a brutal cutthroat transfer portal. Both are super hot and heavy and trying to go find those next guys. It's hard to keep up with because there's just so every day you're at least on the football sense. Like I I'm trying to see who's in the portal and who can fit and this and that. And every time I think there's five or six names I want to dig into, I see another seven or eight names that I'm like, Ooh, those guys could be, and it's like, you just don't know. It's, it's just, uh, you almost have to sit back and just wait to hear uh, something that, about ten year state interest or commitment, because you could kind of grab yourself nuts, just trying to dig into every player that's in the portal. Cause that's <laughs> can't. every, right. every receiver or offensive lineman, you know, I try to keep an eye out for those two because I know those are the two positions that football is looking at, but it's, there's just so many of them. I think that the aspect of where San Diego State in the portal, I think the part that's interesting, the most interesting, is not so much are they going to be able to attract, I think uh, Nigel Pack, I think is the guy who, uh, you know, left – Kansas State, who made an elite eight without him, right? <laughs> right. They're probably win the national championship if he stays, or you know they're they're there. Uh, they only lost to FAU by three without him. You know, you know San Diego State's not going to get that guy in basketball. They're they're not going to get somebody who's you know going to be commanding a hundred thousand dollar you know a hundred thousand dollars for for one year or things like that. Um, that's probably not, that's not their guy. That's not really what they're aiming to do. I mean, uh, and there are schools, man, like the university of New Mexico, I think their goal is to, is to spend three and a half million dollars every year on, on players and, and on, and all, and, you know, and so there's things out there, but I think that the issue is for San Diego state is they're not going to attract guys going after the big money on the front end. So the same kind of guys who can't get that money elsewhere want to come for the culture want to come because the people are there want to come because of the history of development that's at san diego state both on the men the basketball and the football side but it's whether or not they can keep those guys and you know you you just would wonder if um two years ago if nathan mensa had been offered a hundred thousand dollars or something like that to, w- would he have accepted it and not been the anchor and you know yeah. of of this team this year? You know there there's the rumor you know not even the rumors I mean there's people connected around with them talking about you know Kashad Johnson and and losing losing Kashad because of the transfer portal and because of the things that are there. Um, and I think the same question has to be asked about football. You know, like I think football can be a really good place for a guy like Keenan Christian who you know might have more money at an nil school with usc but realize he's playing for the nfl and he's not going to be able to to do that there so he wants to come to san diego state and become a better football player and that stuff okay great portal can be wonderful for you but what happens if you get a guy who's young and he becomes a star um you know and becomes really good uh you know what what is it that San Diego State could do to be able to to keep guys like that and I think that's going to be um you know the piece of it because if you can go to another school and make you know 40 50 60 70,000 dollars I mean I mean who who really is going to be 
like upset or think that they're like making a bad decision because they didn't do that, you know? If we shift gears solely to football, like I think the biggest news in, in the past week was Patrick McMorris. Yeah. Entering the portal. The depth chart came out and I think we both pretty quickly noticed that Patrick McMorris is missing. Yeah. Aztec. I thought it was an oversight. I thought it was an oversight. I did too. I, I was like, there was just no thought in my head that Patrick McMorris would be transferring at this point after the spring. Given given like he came back for a COVID year, he went through spring, he's a leader of the team. It just doesn't happen to San Diego State where like you're one of your stars are, are transferring. And I, I agree. I was I thought it was an oversight too. And and uh, I think it was right right around that time that Kirk Kenny from the UT released a, an article that basically said he's transferring and he's you know going to Cal. And I I was I was shocked. I did not see that coming. I had not heard a thing from any of the people that I talked to that may or may not know about that kind of stuff. And it was uh, completely out of left field. But you know, as we said, you, not, nothing nothing support can really should really surprise you anymore when it comes to the transfer portal. I think Mick Morris's um, departure is is huge. You know, I, I think there's a lot of ways to look at it. And and as the as the the you know year goes on, we get closer to the season. We definitely will. Um, but he was the guy that would come in front of the media. We spoke to him multiple times. Didn't give any hints <laughs> that he wasn't planning doing anything, but just planning to to be an Aztec. And he um, just changed numbers too. And he just changed numbers, and it's, that's not a, that's not a, you know things. Obviously, people can change their minds, but it's just there's so many things that kind of would lead me to being surprised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, I mean, you want to be around family, you want to do all those things, but again, it goes back to the idea of like you know believing that it would be that you'd be better off, or you would think about that he would want to spend spring at Cal, and he'd want to get you know all those kinds of things happening and stuff like that. Although. I mean, I honestly don't know when Cal spring practice is. Maybe, maybe, maybe he made it in time and he gets to have two. I don't know. Um, but I, don't uh, think so. I think they're done. They're done. Okay. So, so yeah, the timing of it, I thought was really, really weird. It could just be that we have misconceptions about the transfer portal. Like no one has seen this extra 15 days and this wasn't an issue before. And yeah. I, and it's interesting because I don't think that it was designed I don't think it's designed for somebody like Big Morris to be able to leave. I think it's designed for, you know, Jacoby Kelly. I think it's designed for Hassan Mahasan, you know. I think it's designed for 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 those kind of people to be able to still find a spot um when they see how low they are on the depth chart or things like that or if spring, you know, is is disagreeable to them and stuff like that. So, it's it's I don't think there's any way to to talk about it other than that it's it is a significant loss for San Diego State. Um, you know, and to, to pretend otherwise, I, I think is is just not true. And you know, it's 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 just it's it's the name of the game. It's what it is. It's this is this is the new normal. I think you said in an article, and and um, as everyone is establishing and figuring out what the new normal is, it's going to be shocking until it isn't, and then it'll just be business as usual. The timing, his brother was a grad assistant at Utah last year. Um, I remember before the Utah game, Morris was at the weekly presser and he brought it up that he was excited to go play Utah because he gets to see his brother. And I think I, I didn't know his brother was a, was a coach or at least a grad assistant. His brother didn't, I think, go to Cal until mid January. So to just to talk about the timing, like, that's probably has a lot to do with why, you know, McMorris had spring at San Diego State because that kind of stuff probably happened later. He's also got another brother that runs track at Cal. I, we don't know if NIL played a factor. I, I think it did. He probably, hopefully, for McMorris' sake, got some NIL deal as part of that, going to a Power Five. The other aspect of it I tried to look at uh, potentially, if you want to look at, you know, a third avenue is NFL development, right? Like after the 21 season, McMorris's draft stock was really high because he about how good of a season he had. 
And then heading into last season, the plan, I think, was I'm going to have another amazing year. I'm going to move up, and I'm going to go to the NFL draft. And even Dane Brugler, when I asked him about McMorris for an article preseason, he said, you know, if McMorris has another great year, he's probably going to be on the back half of those top 10 safeties that are about to be drafted next week. And even though McMorris was still all conference and had, didn't have a bad year, I don't think he took a step back. I think we can all agree with that. I wonder if part of that is looking at this year's defense, looking at playing the Aztec position, and maybe that does, he doesn't see that as being where he's best suited for, obviously, at the next level. Um, Justin Wilcox, who's the coach at Cal, uh, is a defensive guy. He's put, I think, four or five DBs in the NFL draft the last couple of years. So they have a history of, of guys getting to the NFL from that position. And maybe that's something he considered as well to go play in a def different defense, show some different skills before he moves on to the NFL draft. So I'm speculating there. I don't I don't know that for a fact, but that could be another consideration he thought of. Yeah, and I think bottom line, the Aztecs are going to have to figure out moving forward how to get by with the person I think that they were expecting to build their defense around. Coach Hoke often talks about you have to constantly recruit your own players. Yeah. And, you know, this is an example of, of why and an example of something happening that, that doesn't allow for um, an all-conference player to, to, to be in that um, back five. Um, and it'll be interesting to see, you know, exactly what happens moving forward. But, I mean, you want to talk about, like, about it catching you off guard. I mean, the whole reason that Kyron White was switched positions was because his his skill set is so similar to McMorris's that yeah. there's no real way for the two of them to get on the field at the same time, and and so just you know it it it's uh, it's just interesting because you know I think part of the the conversation that we can keep going with this with the the two young wide receivers and the young offensive linemen is that college football is a business. And and typically that works when you talk about the football program relating to the players. And this would be an example of Mick Morris making a business decision that adversely affects San Diego State, the school that he's, you know, graduated from or, you know, close to it. You know, he, he what he did, there's no other way to talk about it. It, it leaves the Aztecs in a bad position. Uh, much in the same way as, you know, and then a fellow free agent deciding to to leave and to go somewhere else. So it's a business. It's a business. And, and the business now, because of the one-time transfer rule, um, cuts both ways a lot more. Yeah, I mean, we, we've talked a lot about how deep and talented the safety class is, the safety room. But we that was a whole intention that McMor they would be playing with and around McMorris, at least for this last year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, when he moved on and Barfield moved on, that those guys would step in next year. And so now those guys are stepping in sooner. And when McMorris isn't there, then then it's suddenly safety becomes another area of concern, potentially, for 2023, because you don't have and McMorris is the, the leadership uh aspect of it is huge too, because of what he's done. Like, there's nobody on the team moving forward that's been a team captain before got new people new leaders have to emerge on the team and and you know you don't know how comfortable those guys are there's obviously a few good guys on the defense that can take that role um but it'll be a new and an just another thing that the team and the defense has to build upon the other three guys who transferred jacoby kelly hassan mahasan and lakai kapoy you know, we I wrote the article about after talking to the two receivers about, you know, the process for them and uh, the conversations with the coaching staff. And, and and it is a business. They both said that I think neither of them wanted to leave, but uh, they were in a position where, you know, they were not going to be playing. And even the coaching staff recommended them to to enter the portal. Uh, it kind of reminds, you know, it kind of flipped it around like Josh Simmons, right? He was a guy who transferred or at least left the team before spring 
even though he wasn't allowed to enter the transfer portal until this past week. You know, you wrote an article about how NIL is the new uh, Power Five, right, where teams like San Diego State are basically developing and breeding talent for the Power Fives, um, right, which is true. You know, it puts San Diego State in a really tough position when you're putting all your time and effort into developing a guy and then he ends up moving on. It's, but, you know, the flip side of it is you got young guys like Kelly and Kaboy and Mahawson who are battling injuries, who put their effort in, and and then suddenly there's really not a spot for them on the team, right? So it, it works both ways. It can hurt the player. It can, hurt, it, it can help the player. It can hurt the team. It can help the team. So that's just the business of it. And, you know, you can look at it from different different viewpoints. But I think what San Diego State needs to do, as we talked about, is right now and they're in this transfer portal window and they need to go out and get guys that can come in and play right away help this year's team and beyond because right now there's a lot of there's a couple units where they're definitely lacking in not just talent level but just a number of bodies um with scholarships yeah i i think everything you said is right um it's it's a it's a real challenging i think topic on how you're supposed to deal with these kinds of things i mean you know, San Diego State definitely was like, hey, you guys need to go to the portal. So this is probably your best move going forward. But at the same time, they ultimately also did leave the decision to both of the receivers. And if they wanted to return, even with like this idea that that they're they're really in the doghouse, like they really got to, you know, show something that they that the staff doesn't even believe that's necessarily there anymore, that they would have had those opportunities. And, I, and, you know, as they said, as both of them said, you know, they, they didn't want to go, they didn't want to have be at places where that they weren't wanted. Um, yeah. And, and we get that it makes complete sense. Um, I think, as you said, you know, I think that the, 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 the hard part with all three of those guys that, that is just more to the story is what would you say are the, are the two lightest, like the two, lightest positions on the team the two, the line wide receiver right and 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 they're not making headway when the talent level is not where the team would like to get it and mm-hmm. i think that's a, that's another you know that's another like important component to all of this is is you know if if san diego state does what it hopes it's going to do you know in the in the next few years we won't be saying that about offensive line and we won't be saying that about wide receiver. And so I think that's, that's another really challenging part of it. And, and, you know, what, what do you, yeah, I don't know. I just, what, what, what is like the, the, the best course of action, you know, is the best course of action just to say nothing and to not, you know, be honest about where you think a person is, um, is the best course because, you know, you want to, you know, build a culture where a guy who's getting recruited by San Diego State now, you know, understands that like feels like he's going to be supported throughout, right? Or do you, you know, understand that it's really competitive and scholarships are year to year things, and you know there are certain expectations that have to be met, and it's it's just there's not a <clears throat> there's not an easy way to do it. Um, I don't know what is the 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 best way forward for San Diego State in in that regard because it's in in that article that you referenced the argument that I was making was they they need to find guys who are going to be good 3 years after they start at San Diego State that that's their best bet if they can't get NIL to be at a competitive level letting go and encouraging guys to go into the portal who are young guys, you know, might not encourage people to stick around for very long either, you know? And so it's, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword with, with how you, you know, with how you approach it. Well, you mentioned the impacts on future recruiting. I mean, Mahasan is that Sarah pipeline that we've been talking about. Yep. Is that going to impact future Sarah guys who are seeing what happened with Hassan. Uh, now, I saw today they they just offered, I think, an athlete or a running back from Sarah 
yeah. for this class today. Um, I don't think it's necessarily going to have, you know, an immediate impact. But, you know, guys like Jacoby and Hassan and 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 whoever are going to get asked by future recruits about their their what process and their time and things like that. But that's I don't think that's what San Diego State makes their immediate decisions uh, thinking of. You know, it's it's a consideration, but uh, they're obviously doing what they feel is best for the team, you know, current and future. Outside of offensive line and wide receiver, do you think there's another position that they need to target in the transfer portal in this next uh, week or two? You know, I, I don't think that it would be otherworldly crazy if they got a veteran QB. You know, I I, I think that both um, Maiden's performance in spring and coupled with the fact that the other guys are very, very young wouldn't make that just be like, what? Can you believe that they got a QB? I, I think that, you know, Lindley said it, I thought, very, very well, where he said you're kind of at um at the position where you can you can just kind of get the best best position, the best player that you can get. I, I uh am not adept enough at watching practice yet to know how good their defensive line is. But if if I had to if I had to wager a guess right now where they're at, I don't think they're ready. I think I think if they could if they could get a defensive lineman who could come in there and and be one of the positions, either the tackle or the end, um, and can really be an impact guy, I think I think that would be huge. But you know, I think the biggest challenge that you that you run into again, it goes back to the same conversation who's going to come to San Diego state who has been an impact guy at a higher level than San Diego state already plays at like guys transfer like crazy who have been impact guys all over the place. But the question becomes when they transfer, what are they looking for? And 99 times out of a hundred or, you know, 90 times out of a hundred, they're looking for an NIL opportunity. And I just don't know that San Diego state, at this point in where Aztec link is, has the ability to be competitive that way. And so, you know, what you are able to, what, what the staff, the, the hard job that the staff has to do is they have to find a guy who hasn't really played somewhere who Uh, they can in a short period of time, bring in and have them be one of their starters or a significant contributor in what they're doing. And, um, I think that that's that's a tall task. That's that's a that's a big big challenge. I think where where their team's going to be is going to be huge. Yeah, well, one thing I wanted to add real quick is if I see a guy enter the portal that's at a power 5 school and they've started and they've played a lot, I pretty much don't don't even think about them potentially being someone San Diego State looks at because for the same reason you just said like why would they leave a power five to come to San Diego state, unless there's like this hometown connection, right? Like a yeah. Yeah. Uh, or the brotherly connections, even though um, I don't think Cooper played at Washington. He started in some games too, but you know, there was, you know, I think, he, I, I think, I think Cooper's a, a really good and, and Mark Redman. I think they're both really good examples of the kinds of players. JD coffee. Um, I think he's a, he's a really good example of 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 the kinds of guys that and the transfer portal I think has been a net positive for San Diego State. I don't think there's any question about that. Even with McMorris leaving, you know, I, I think that they that I agree with you. Like uh, it, it, the guys that they can get, that's the biggest challenge because you you try to go and again going back to your you know searching fourteen hundred guys who are entering to the portal or whatever it is by now, you really got to find a guy like Raphael Williams you know, who was really productive at a lower level, who then can, can jump up and, and do something, um, thing, things of that nature. And, and, um, it, this is where they, they, the coaching staff has to, to kind of earn their money and prove how good they are. Um, because you know, the, the, this team has, has, you know, some significant things to improve on. Um, and because of the transfer portal, they actually have the opportunity to, 
go out and do it. You know, I mean, if this was any, if this was the regular years or whatever, like this is your team, you know? Yeah. Uh, one but, one right. last thing on the transfer thing that I wanted to pose to you before we get to the depth chart. You talked about the transfer portal being a net positive. Mm-hmm. And I totally agree with that. And I even agree with that. If you look at it from football and basketball perspective, like sure. up until this year, I mean, there's not most of the guys at San Diego State on, in both football and basketball that transferred were guys at the end of the bench that weren't able to get on the field. And very few of them transferred to power five schools. Zylan Cheatham is one guy I thought of who was a starter who transferred yep. and went to power five and was a big player there and, but you know, made an NBA. But, but Zylan Cheatham was not an all conference player. Like, is Patrick McMorris the the biggest transfer out of San Diego State, at least in the last 15, 20 years? I, am I forgetting another fo- a football player in that? Because McMorris is a two-time all-conference player. No, no, yeah, 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 no, he's huge. He's like, huge. Like, yeah. He, and then you look at Keisha Johnson, although he wasn't an all-conference player either, but he's another big name. And I think that's where people have to get used to that. We say new normal. The stuff we're not San Diego State's not used to losing guys that are actually guys that they want to keep. And we've seen yeah. Josh Simmons, we saw it with CJ Baskerville, and then now McMorris. And I think we're gonna be seeing that every year now, uh, as much as it pains me to say that, and because you're seeing it everywhere. But it just took I think it took an extra year or two to hit San Diego State finally, but it, it finally has. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, I think I think you're right. I can't come up with anybody else that off the top of my head about who would be a bigger transfer. This is another element that life in college football, life in college basketball, you know, you assemble a coaching staff, not necessarily to be good at keeping your current players happy. Yeah. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, like all these guys who were hired, you know, three years ago, four years ago, um, that might not have been a consideration was how well they could keep their room engaged and stuff like that. And yet, you know, that, that, that is another now part of their job description. You know, I, I think I read about, there was a, a a coach and he left the college game and that was the reason because it just was a lot neater. You could just focus on football in the NFL and like, that's kind of it. Yeah. But anyway, depth chart, depth chart, man, what, 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 what are, what are some of your, Interesting takeaways, thoughts about the depth chart. Well, we have to start off with Brandon Crenshaw Dixon. Yeah. Like, it's a great story. It, I, I laughed when I saw the depth chart. Um, <laughs> all the time we spent during the spring talking about it, asking Coach Hoke about it, asking yeah. Lindley about, you know, what is why is BCD playing with the twos? And, and you know, ultimately – he ends up listed as a starting right tackle, even though he did not play very many snaps with the first team at right tackle. After playing left, starting at left tackle last year and starting at right tackle two years before. So right. I know there has been certain theories about why they had Crenshaw Dixon playing backup. And I, I know you talked about wanting to give as a party run and with the first team to see how he would do go up against first team defense, but I still it doesn't it doesn't fully click to me why he would be with the twos, even though they intended him to be the starter at right back. Well I but that that, 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 that theory is just because that's what the coaching staff said when we when we would yeah. ask them the questions. That was their answer. And so it's just okay. I guess that's what they're doing. Yeah, I you know I mean my feeling is that there's a there is you know, and I, I I think that they're going to be trying to to get other guys as well. Um, but I, I think their feeling is that BCD has played enough football that they could plug him into four of the five positions and he would be solid. Yeah. And so I think it was a com- competition between and still is a competition between Jones and as a party. And, it, you know, as as the roster currently is configured. Whoever was the better one. BCD would play the other side. I think right now, if Jones got hurt, BCD would slide over and as a party would be, you know, the right, right tackle. And so he's kind of, yeah. he's, he's kind of the swing tackle. He just happens to be the better of the three. I, I you know, I, I think that that's primarily what it was. 
I think that there is some merit to wanting those two tackles to play as much as they could against Garrett Fountain. I think they wanted to to see those guys against their best and and you know trying to do that and that's at least something that they they talked about uh multiple times and yeah yeah but it is interesting it is it is a really interesting idea and you know and I think the last time that we left asking you know needs for the transfer portal you know they didn't mention tackle they mentioned interior alignment and then also with the idea that BCD could slide down um, and be inside if uh, Ross uh, Musui had to play center. So yeah, I, I think yeah. that there's a there's a lot that that can still happen between now and then. And you know, it, it wouldn't be shocking in the slightest that there are two different players starting on the offensive line that like aren't in camp, aren't on San Diego State's roster presently. And so that that's the part of it I think is is really fascinating is. You know, what 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 does that look like? Is that a guard and then you're able to slide him over? Is that a guard and a tackle, a center and a tackle? You know, it, it's 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 not a an easy thing, but I think those musical chairs I think could could stop in such a way that there are two players that are not on San Diego State's roster right now who end up taking the field against um, you know, Ohio. Yeah, just a couple other stuff on the offensive side. You know, Martin Blake had been playing that fullback role last year once Jeff Gordon took over. But he's not he's listed as a running back. Yeah. Nick Gardner is listed as a fullback. Mm-hmm. That was interesting because Martin Blake is a little bit bigger. Um, really played well in that role, I thought. But he also had some nice run at, at running back during spring spring camp. So we'll see there. And then Cameron Harpole, I think made the biggest jump in terms of depth chart um, with the tight ends coming up to second uh, and then starter at the H position. So like he, he's made drastic improvement in the last two years. So, you know, he, you know, the number change maybe helped. He's 86. <laughs> it was always weird, always weird to see a tight, tight end wearing a 49, right? In the yeah. 40. Yeah. Um, now he looks a lot more like a tight end wearing 86, but uh, you get to see him kind of, you know, move up uh, with the depth chart and potentially be one of those starters in, the, in that 12 personnel. We talked with uh, Sawai Esalu, I want to say last May, and we were asking for that rundown of the tight ends. And we said, oh, man, what what is it about Cam Harple that that you're, you know, tell us about him. And he's like, oh, man, that guy's fast. And I think since he described him that way i think he's been somebody that that everyone's kind of paid attention to but you know those guys get to play because they hang their hat on blocking i think you could really see the improvement from that group as a whole even from from what they did last year i hope just because you know he's he's a nice kid and 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 all of those things that jay rudolph um is going to factor in more than he was able to because of injuries during spring um, and I would I would expect them to. I mean, right now it's it's really interesting. Like, I think thirteen personnel could be one of their best if they're willing to split one of those tight ends out wide. I think it could give them their their best. Like, if you go and say, okay, who are your five best skill position players? I think it very easily could be argued that you know Makai Shaw is your one wide receiver, and then you know you do you do Rudolph Harpool. Christian in the backfield and 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 then Redmond as the as the last tight end and that those would be your five like highest level players regardless of position and so it'll be interesting to see if you know they they do do they go with some of those kind of things and you know pre-shift put people outside and and try to create those matchups play a little bully ball I know nobody likes it but I mean you know you talk about the fullback position but I mean you know, Jay Rudolph can play fullback and he yeah. becomes your fullback and and you force them to have to play a little bit bigger to to match up against your personnel. And then you're putting, you know, two guys in Redmond and um, Harple who can who can run. I mean, those guys can both get downfield like skillful tight ends, you know, that that that, you know, it's just it's not normal for them. And so. I think there's there's potential there to to use the depth that they have at tight end 
in a way that is different. The flip side of all of that is, is that skill set, does that really complement Jalen Maiden and what he does in the passing game? Um, and so there's there's a lot of questions I think that need to be answered. What is your what is your feeling about the way that the um, wide receiver group um, ended up on the depth chart? Because I think there's some surprises there. Yeah, it's clear that Makai Shaw is the number one guy. I think we would probably would have said that coming into spring. Um, the depth chart coming in, you would have said that coming into spring. Yeah. Wow, I would not have. Sorry, Makai. I would not have. I I would not. He now I'm saying it coming out. He was he was fantastic during spring. Coming in, I was like, I was like, oh man, do they yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say just because he was the only guy that played and produced on the on the before this season, he has a track record of production, not as the number one, obviously, as the number three, but like nobody else on that on that wide receiver room had any production. Now, Raphael Williams did, but that was at the FCS level, uh, which is why I thought, okay, Makai is going to be the number one guy. Um, Breon Penny slotting down and Philippe Wesley starting. I think that was a surprise. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not shocked. Um, I think we've talked about Breon a lot on the podcast that, you know, he's He's, you know, last year he had ample opportunity and he, he he made some plays, but he didn't take that next step. And, you know, some other, uh, some of the younger receivers might be passing him up this year uh, who are who are coming in hungry for playing time and their opportunities. And we feel, we've heard a lot about Josh Nicholson, Philippe Wesley, and then you also have Rafael Williams who's, who's trying to make a case. So those guys look like they might have, you know, at least caught up or passed beyond, at least on the depth chart and getting some playing time. My, the other guy who I really like, who, you know, kind of had a nice spring game was Mikey Welsh. You know, kind of that that over the middle guy who can just get open. He's not he's not gonna, you know, get 30 yards down the field and and catch bombs, but those third and short situations where you need a guy to get open in the middle of the zone and 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 catch those first down passes. I mean, he he could potentially fill fill that kind of a role for the team this year. No, I agree, and and I, I think when you go and you know, I mean, just in the description that you, that you gave, um, man, it, that's a tough position, man. I mean that 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 is a very very. You know, I think if Breon Penny had a monster spring and you know they were feeling really good about it, I think that was like the path forward to being able to say that they might be okay at wide receiver. But uh, it, it'll be interesting. I mean, Williams was hit. I saw him one time at practice and the rest of the time he was out. Um, he obviously had a good spring game. Uh, in the in the little time that did see him, he's really fast and 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 does those things. Um, but you know, I, I I definitely think that if they have the opportunity to bring some players in, th- they have they have the the recruiting chip, which is you got a quarterback who throws the ball, and they should have snaps available, and and asking somebody to come in to be able to do that, you know, is at least in theory. A, a good recruiting thing but I, I think that you know i agree about mikey welsh that he was one of the better receivers that we saw in practice i just don't know what that says about the position <laughs> if i'm if i'm honest well they need size yeah but breon penny he's six three but if he's dropping in the depth chart and he's getting passed up by you know six foot five ten five eleven guys and he's not going to be out there then you need guys that have that height that can play that jump ball 50 50 pass stuff red zone targets with fade passes things like that so i mean they they obviously need talent mm-hmm. if you've got a guy on the portal that's 5 10 but he's an amazing player that obviously you go after him but like they also need to target some some height some tall guys who can fill kind of you know tyrell shaver is a 6 6 you're not going to find 6 6 guys probably in the portal at this point Right. Uh, well, you don't need six, 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 three. 
uh, guys, I think, are tall enough because you're not going to find a ton of corners that are, you know, 6'3 or taller. But, yeah, they, they, need, they need size to, and, to obviously, talent to go with the guys that they've got right now because that's definitely lacking. Yeah, and I think trying to to you know forecast like what what their year is going to be, and obviously, you know the summer plays out, and there's a lot of things that need to happen. If I'm an opposing defense, I am bottling up Keenan Christian, trying to do whatever I can not to let that guy get to the edge. I'm on, I'm playing my I'm playing lanes. I'm playing very conservative. You know he can have three yards up the middle. And I'm going to allow those guys on the outside to prove that they can beat my guys in one-on-one coverage. And I I think that the one thing that bodes well for San Diego State in that scenario is Jalen Maiden, for all of the things that he did, the one thing I thought he did better than quarterbacks for a very long time at San Diego State is he recognized and took the gimme passes that the defense just presented him and he he was content with throwing a five-yard pass and he located the guy to do it sometimes that's all that you need to be able to to soften up um the middle a little bit but then going over to the defensive side of the ball um you know obviously mcmore's not being listed at the aztec i thought was really really interesting I, what also tipped me off to it is i'm looking for kyron white i was looking for him at linebacker like okay well i wonder wonder what headway he made there and i'm like Where's Kyron White? You know, I have to go, have to push, you know, control F to be able to find where he was. Like, what is he doing as four string on the on the Aztec? Like, what? Yeah. So I, I I thought that was that was pretty strange. But uh, you know, I'm really intrigued with the cornerback position at San Diego State. I think that they have guys who can play. Um yeah. and I'm really curious to see if more than two get to be on the field at any time, you know, ensure passing down again, I'm making this up, but I mean, we did talk with, with uh, coach Maddox at times and he talked about getting the five best guys out there and things like that. But just in like sure passing downs, you know, I, I think that there was part of what they struggled with early, not only was covering guys in the slot, but I thought that McMorris and Baskerville both had a hard time just covering period. And they, when, when, when McMorris was really good, he got to just kind of roam the center of the field and he got to just play off of his instincts and, and he covered more, I thought last year than in other years. And I thought that, um, that had something to do with him having a little bit of an off year when Baskerville was replaced. I thought they were better because McMorris didn't have to cover as much. They, they, they could, they could, um, have, um, you know, the, the warrior safeties do that. And so I think that potentially, you know, if you have like a sure passing down, you know, you could bring in one of those corners, yeah. have them play what would be the warrior safety and put, you know, put uh, Barfield or somebody else, you know, in there. And so I, I'm just curious to see if, if that possibility is there, because I think there are legitimately, you know, five guys that can play how they're going to be able to to do all of those snaps. You know, I, I think it's, I, I thought in the time that I saw, I thought that um, Dallas Branch was a lot better than he was last year. And I thought he was sensational last year. I thought he was physical yeah. in practice. I thought he understood routes better. I thought he played more instinctual. And so for him to not be listed as the starter, I think speaks volumes of where, Noah Avenger is. And and so I think that's really exciting. I thought Des Malone, he looked like an absolute playmaker and stud. Um, watching him play, it was like, I mean, I made the made the comment that it would not be shocking to me if this was his final year at San Diego State, because he has all the physical tools that you could possibly want. And if he puts them together and 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 can play as a corner. And so how they're going to, you know, have a guy like a Noah Tumlin, Chris Johnson. I mean, I mean, these guys that that I mean, that's five guys that I think are legit, yeah. I think can play. And it'll be interesting to see with McMorris's departure, if it begs for a little bit more of that creativity to to be able to 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 cover some of those things and and to and to play there, especially on those like sure passing downs. 
it, by having five guys for two positions is tough. It is. Uh, which is why if you asked me what positions I could see players transferring mm-hmm. in this portal window, I would have mentioned cornerback, not because, you know, guys would not want to compete, but because it's just a numbers game, right? You've got five guys that are really good and deserve to play, and only two can. I don't know. None of them have uh, as of this point. And, I, you know, I'm not saying I expect them to, but I wouldn't have been surprised. But that right, is there's, a, there, there's still time, right? There's still time. 12 yeah. days, 12 days. Yeah. And but there is that that competition is I know a tumbling is listed as the fifth guy right now. Right. Technically, you had two picks in the spring game. <laughs> played really well. Yeah. And we talked to him after the game and he flat out said, you know, I haven't had a good spring. I didn't have a good spring. And I wanted to make sure that I, in this last opportunity, that I came out and I showed out because, you know, I needed it, right? And he did. He had two picks. He made several other plays, but he's still listed third. Now, last year, Chris Johnson was that fifth guy, but as a freshman, a true freshman, he didn't play a ton. Those four guys rotated, started, all started and rotated a ton. Yeah. So four guys did play a lot of snaps. They did. Uh, so th- I don't think the coaching staff is against playing, you know, three or four guys. Absolutely. Uh, but that, that fifth guy is probably the, the odd man out. But if, as you say, if they could potentially use a, kind of a nickel back in that, in that fifth se- uh, secondary role, that could be more opportunity to get guys on the field. So yeah, who, who knows how to, that'll play. Obviously the coaching staff has, you know, the summer to figure it out. I wonder if one of these five guys gets moved to a warrior position by the time the fall practice and depth chart comes out. You, you, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, no, that's where Des Malone started from, and they they felt like they needed to move. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Who knows? The other thing that surprised me about the defense was a couple guys listed in positions that they didn't play during spring. <laughs> Why would that surprise you? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, we joke nothing in these uh, depth charts, just, but but Tupu Alualu, he was a defensive end almost all of spring, and he's listed yeah. as one of the three potential starters for defensive tackle. Right, which we didn't see him play defensive tackle in no. seven on seven or eleven eleven. Vai Kaho listed at, on, as a backup to Zyrus at the mic. Uh, he's been pre- predominantly a weak side linebacker, right? couple of years uh brady anderson is listed as one of the wills with cody moon so i those flip-flops a little surprising but um you know i think it's just the coaching staff trying to get as many people in positions and as possible but yeah and that, that 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 was another surprising thing in addition to uh mcmorris not being there obviously i think brady anderson is a very very exciting player um, I think DJ Herman is another exciting player. I think he's really good on special teams. Um, and I think that that's, I think that if there's anybody with all of these oars that are listed in the defense or all of this depth, of these positions, I think if there's anybody who's like really happy about that, it's Doug Deacon. Um, I think that, that between uh, the guys as the tight ends, linebacker, safety, corner, I think that that there's there all of their coverage units and stuff should be pretty good. Uh, my, you know, it's the same question we kind of brought it up before. The number of people that they list as oars in the defensive line, it it just it feels like it, it's you know that if you if you sometimes if you have too many, it means you don't have any, and that's that's kind of the the, the sense that I I get from it is that is that they're not sold on anybody yet. I don't know. I don't know, you know, exactly where they're going to be looking for and how that's going to shake out, but I think they could definitely use help there. The linebackers, I I thought all camp, they were really good. Like I, I was, I was honestly surprised. Um, not so much because I didn't think that the guys that were there were talented, but they lost so much from the, that last year and they lost so much the year before that it's just a different dynamic. And and I thought all of those guys that you listed 
add in New Zealand Williams, who had a pick in, you know, in the time that we were there. I just thought that they all looked physical. They all looked fast. You Trey know, White. He's Trey he's, White. Yes. He, he's the youngest guy out of the nine guys listed at linebacker, the Richard freshman. He's already passed up uh, Daryl Masaniai. Like he, I can see him getting on the field because with Cooper, I can see Cooper playing defensive end on some third and longs. Interesting. And, I like that idea. And I think that'll, because he did last year. Uh, there were times where Cooper or Caden kind of became that third defensive end and Jonah moved inside and Justice came off the field. And I think that I, I could see Cooper playing B.E. on some third and longs, and then that could open up Trey White getting in there as a, as a Sam. And so, yeah, it's I, I agree the linebackers are, you know, behind the corners. I would have said corner, safety, and then linebacker, but with McMorris gone, I, I might move the linebackers up to second best uh, uh, positional group on the defense at, at the moment. Which which I would say is better than you could have ever possibly ex- yeah. ex- expected from spring football. I mean, usually nothing ever gets done for spring football. You just kind of get a little bit of an organizational feel for it. Um, so the fact that, for instance, that they don't know which linemen are going to be in the rotation, like that's normal, you know. Yeah. And, and it's nothing, it's, you know, it's nothing even to worry about. Like that's, that's the pecking order is kind of all that you could have expected about that. But for them to feel seemingly as good about the linebackers as they do and and that you could list them and say, okay, I think they're my, probably the second positional group. I, I, th- I think it's pretty significant, especially because yes, McMorris left those young safeties and JD coffee, they all flashed at times. And I thought I thought that the staff did a really good job. You know, and and this is just my feeling on things. People can view it other ways. But if I can watch a practice and I can see the rhyme and reason of why they're doing something, because sometimes I miss it. You know, it's, it's sometimes it's hard for me to pick those things out, but I could see them intentionally challenging their young safeties with, you know, for instance, they made Josh Hunter cover tight ends a whole bunch when I watched them play. And I, my guess is, is that in a regular, in a regular game, they would shade him to the opposite side from the tight end. Um, they, they, they funneled things to him to make him make tackles in the open field. I thought it was the complete opposite that they didn't let him cover tight ends and made those fast shiftier wide receivers go in front of them. And um, you know, uh, Max Garrison, I thought that they they put him in position where they forced him to not like catch. If I think that's the right phrase, where they needed him to get downhill and attack, and and I thought that they did that, and they did a good job of putting them at like pressure points so they could grow and improve, and and all of those guys I thought did well and and again going back to the depth for special teams and the depth that they can have i wouldn't be surprised if those guys were pushing for time obviously garrison along with uh, marcus ratcliffe and marcus ratcliffe i mean that dude's a, that dude is a unicorn out there and he yeah, he he's is big he's really like like abnormally tall and you know it, it it's it's that's the kind of guy going back to this conversation about mcmorris playing center field uh, Ratcliffe, that's what he did at Cathedral, and he has great range, and just his size and his height, he could be that guy playing center field. So to say that the linebackers have passed that group, I, I think that, that is a, that's a major, major development. Um, and I asked the question on, on Twitter, half jokingly, but I'll ask you, is um, Kurt Maddox a better defensive coordinator or a position coach? Ooh, that's a pause. That's a long pause. I like that. I think he's a better defensive coordinator. Is but it is, I mean, is it is it a fair question? Me- meaning, like, he's a really good defensive coordinator. <laughs> <all right. laughs> you know what I'm saying? And 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 to be thinking about all of the players that he's developed in just the short time that he's been here. It's it's in the conversation, which you know I I you know we all we talk all the time. 
about how great of a defensive coordinator we think that he is. We are, uh, before we get out of here, additional piece of news was uh, a new running backs coach for the second time uh, this year. Uh, Jimmy Beal from Montana State was named the uh, running backs coach uh, earlier this week. He Montana State has had one of the best uh, rushing attacks in the FCS. I think they were second last year. Aztec transfer Kagan Williams was actually on Montana State this past year, although he got injured and missed uh, the season. But he was coached by Jimmy Beal without before the injury. We we don't know that much about him, obviously, since he's coming from an FCS program. But uh, statistically, his teams have done really well running the ball. Uh, and, we'll, and, you know, he doesn't have the associate head coach role that Ron Gold had. Mm-hmm. Uh, so and that, Jeff Horton before that. And Jeff Horton before that, yeah. So I think that probably goes because he hasn't been a head coach. He doesn't have the F- FBS experience. But uh, we'll see. You know, he... He, uh, I already saw that he's been talking to recruits and putting offers out there uh, on social media, or at least players have said they talked to him and, and got an offer from him. So he's he's uh, off and running, and and we'll see uh, we'll see what happens. What are your thoughts about the hire? I was a little bit surprised, not that I know anything about Montana State or know anything about that that side of things, but just everything that they said about coach gold and what they liked about him, his experience, you know, having somebody, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I was kind of expecting somebody a little bit longer in the tooth um, only yeah. because that seemed like their kind of way of thinking. And so I, I would, uh, I, you know, I don't know this, not inside information, but I'm really curious about who their offensive analyst is going to be. Um, and we talked to uh, Coach Lindley about, you know, what he would be looking for in that. And he says, you know, you can go a lot of different ways, but I, it would not surprise me if that person was um, was somebody that that has been around and, and that he can bounce those ideas off of. Um, the flip side of it is, you know, Ryan Lindley seemingly is thought of in so many circles so highly that he t- talks about how many other coaches are like helping him and he's discussing things with them and stuff like that, that maybe it's just unnecessary. And, and they wanted to, to, to go out and, and find somebody that, that they're going to, um, you know, hopefully turn into kind of this, this young up and coming coaching staff that is kind of the way offensive football is, is, is going in many ways. You know what I mean? Like, younger and 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 it just fits it and so i think end of the day i mean i think this is clearly ryan lindley's staff i i think the proof is going to be with what they're able to do with it i definitely think that every single running back you know that's listed there um i mean one one through one through six and i did not intentionally forget and the guys that they're bringing in i think every one of them has the potential to be a star every one of them something is holding them back and i think that you know you 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 can just go down the list you know keenan christian uh, there's a vision issue there there's something about just being able to hit that hole and and really get where that speed and power and all the things that he kind of has that this, his receiving ability those kinds of things can can fully get there um, Cam Davis, you know, there, there's that, there's, there's, there's the deceptiveness, there's the toughness, but just putting it together to be that consistent guy, it's just not quite there. Jalen Armstead, tough physical runner that, that somehow disappears at times, you know, you get a guy like Lucky Sutton and, um, I think he's fourth on the depth chart. And, and I mean, uh, there's not a more talented back, I would argue. I mean, there were, there were times that I was just like, wow, like, you know, when guys are in shorts and and they can just be athletically better than everyone else on the field, it's it's special. But but he runs so tall, he runs like he's a small back instead of running like he's a big back. Um, you know, Martin Blake, the fact that he's the fifth guy above Sheldon Canley, and you see Martin Blake and 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 you know, it can can that be more than just a nice story, you know? And then you get a Sheldon Canley who's who's you know, again, he's that home run threat. He he's, but 
there's the the consistency that he's lacking and and you get all of those things and and there's if he can turn that group from being good and being like talented to being great i think that lot that is the hope of san diego state having a good year like if i'm looking around and i'm saying where do they get to be elite that you kind of to complement what maiden brought it's somebody in the running back room or two people in the running back room being a great running back. Cause they didn't have it last year. They haven't had it for a few years and, and really getting that next level kind of running back from that group. And I think their offense could go from being mediocre and pedestrian to being something that, that defenses fear and the win total, you know, I think could, could get up to double digits and stuff like that. If there is, a player in that backfield who can become a star. Big if, big if. And oh, huge. <laughs> it, that, that's in conjunction with an offensive line that could play better than they played last year and can block and open holes and and do all that stuff. Uh, anything else we got to talk about before we get out of here? Well, there's probably 75 other things that we could talk about, but I think uh, I think after missing a month, I think I think that was that's a good. Uh, a good summary. Uh, earlier I lied. I said this is episode 65. This is actually episode 66. So I wanted to clear that up. 66. <laughs> 66. All right, guys. Thank you guys for listening. You can find us on uh, social media on Twitter. I'm a, at a Hagrid 23. Paul is at Padre de Quattro. That's it. Obviously, you can like, subscribe, follow, share the podcast on all your favorite platforms. Uh, We appreciate all you guys tuning in. Hopefully um, you guys had a good chance to catch up with some episodes you had been uh, missing during our hiatus, but we're back and hopefully we can get this back on a regular schedule once again, uh, as we head into uh, summer. Uh, Hopefully now that spring camp is over, we can get some interviews with some of the, uh, some more interviews with some of the coaches and then get some of the players uh, on here. So, We look forward to that, and we'll talk to you guys next time. You are listening to the SDSU Football Podcast, presented by the East Village Times with your hosts, Andre Hagverdian and Paul Garrison.